Okay, we're turning again to 1 John chapter 5. We're going to only take a small portion of this. I'm sorry you guys have missed chapters 1 through 4. And this is actually part 2 of a two-part message because we're only taking in uh, chunks at a time. John has so much to teach us to show us, and I felt from time to time as we've gone through 1 John that the Apostle John is still living because of these words. These words that he wrote when he was probably in his 90s, and the last apostle standing, representing Jesus Christ, the one who had laid hands on him, touched him, showed him, saw him, showed him to others, and probably preached and taught many, many times. And a lot of that teaching is condensed into these five chapters. It's amazing. In 1 John 5, 6 to 10, we have three that testify, and that is really the first part of the message that we're not going to deal with, the truth that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, perhaps you're not struggling with that issue as Jesus, the Son of God, but in John's day, many, many people were struggling with that very thing, Jesus being God himself, the Son of God. So this is about that testimony. But the testimony was water, blood, and the Holy Spirit. They all had a part in this. And he's calling this the testimony of God, but he comes a little clearer in the verses we'll cover this morning. So I'm just briefly outlining those first part, the first part from 6 to 10, and then we'll get into the verses 11 to 13 more pointedly. So the contrast is between receiving the testimony of men and the testimony of God. God came as a man. He was born as a man. And through that birthing process, there was water. I think it's as simple as that. You don't have to make the water complicated here. He came into this world in the normal way that all children are born from their mother through water. But he left this world, albeit in a diff different way than most people die, he still died as most people do. So he was born and he died. The blood is significant because it's pointing us to the cross of Christ, that death, that persecution of death on him who sin not. And the truth of all this comes because the Holy Spirit has given his witness that combines all of these three together and makes them three in one in agreement. Jesus is the Son of God. However, there are those who deny that Jesus is the Son of God. What are they doing? John says very pointedly, they're calling God a liar. We don't want to be in that boat. Today we will read about God's testimony more pointedly, I think. What is he getting at here with this testimony? So reading again, and again, I'm not reading from the NIV. I'm reading from the Holman Christian Standard. It's like the ESV if you have it, but if you want to turn to the Holman Christian Standard, it's a uh, literal understanding. And here are the words. This is the testimony of God. He has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Now we're going to look at each of these points exactly as they're put together here. Verse 12 says, the one who has the Son has life. The one who does not have the Son does not have life. Very simple words. 
very profound statement. And then the last one, I have written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. So first of all, let me say at the very beginning, don't turn off the words of John here because you already know that Jesus is the Son of God. You've already accepted that and you, you've immersed yourself in the fact that the one you have in you is God himself, the Son of God, through the Holy Spirit. We'll come back to that verse again, though. The testimony of God is eternal life is in the Son. Now think about this, the importance of it. Who is Jesus? Well, I'm just going to give you some things that comes through the book of John, 1 John here. Not the entire New Testament, there's so much more. So the Son is light. It says in chapter 1, verse 5, God is light. And that's talking about the Son also. He is light. He is our advocate with the Father. Do you need a lawyer? The most excellent lawyer, like the most excellent physician, is Jesus Christ. Chapter 2, verse 1, he is our advocate with the Father. In chapter 2, also verse 29, it says he is righteousness. Do you like being right? Righteousness is all about doing the right thing, saying the right thing, being right. It's not about winning arguments. It's not about going out and trying to best all of the evildoers in the world with just the right words and arguments. But you want to say what's right. He is right all the time. He is righteousness. He is pure. We're talking about Jesus. Verse 3 of chapter 3, he is pure. Think about that. Pure holiness walked among us. God himself, Emmanuel. Showing us, number one, we don't need sin. We, we, we think sinfully. We do sinful things. We, we want sin. We desire it. It captures us. It makes things seem so great. But he is pure. Note the words of Chapter 3, verse 5 and 8. He appeared to take away sins. In him there is no sin. And to destroy the works of the devil. What we could never do, get rid of our sins. We talk about forgiveness. A lot of people talk about forgiveness and thinks that wipes the slate clean. Well, for many, it's only wiping it clean for a little while until the next sin, and the next one, and the next one. And I'm reminded from Hebrews and the conscience study that we're doing in our small group, if you'd like to join us, that that's not complete until it reaches into the heart. The very core of our being must be clean, without guilt to stand before God. We'll look at that verse also in a, in a bit too. Take away sins. In the Son of God there is no sin. He is your best friend who has no sin. He never does anything wrong, always says what is right. To destroy the works of the devil... Now, I have a lot of friends that think the devil is on one shoulder and an angel on the other shoulder and that there's a constant battle going on. There is a battle usually going on. It's in the conscience. But here is the one and the only one who could destroy the works of the devil. And he, have it, he came and he had to give his blood to pay that penalty. 
one last verse. Or no, I have, I have more actually. In chapter 4, verse 8, God is love. He is love. Jesus is love. So we're singing about love. Amazing love. I, I love that song. It gets my, right to my heart because it, it's describing Jesus Christ for us, in us, who wants to walk with us every day, that love. It says this in chapter 4, verse 9, right after verse 8, God is love. By this love, God has revealed in us that God has sent his only son into the world so that we may live through him. A lot of this message is about eternal life, but look at what the son has. What he gives you now in the here and now is life. Your mind's not burdened with sin. Sin is taken care of. You're not di diverted off the path by the devil because he's destroyed the works of the devil. Now the one last verse. I want to remind you what it says in verse 1 of chapter 5. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Messiah has been born of God. Born of God. And now we go to verse 11. Because the testimony of God is eternal life in the Son. What could be more important? And then he gives us a syllogism. Some of you teachers here remember what a syllogism is? Two premises and then a conclusion based on those two statements. So he has two statements and a conclusion here. And they come from God. They're not just from anyone. This is the testimony of God. And he's making this contrast between you believe men and that they give you a syllogism and they build it up and it sounds conclusive, doesn't it? But here's God's testimony. God has a gift for man, and that is eternal life. That's number one. Number two, eternal life is in the Son. So these two things means that Jesus is both eternal God, and he is the one that has life the life we need. He is the only way to have eternal life. What is the conclusion of the two premises then? You find that in verse 12. So I read it again. The one who has the Son has life, and the one who does not have the Son does not have life. So there's a positive and a negative result in that conclusion. And we're all in that. Everyone here is either has or has not. Now, we want to stop a moment and think here. Ask ourselves a question. Do we want to live forever? Mm -hmm. By the very basis of you eating and sleeping and doing things, you're admitting that you want to live. And you want to be you know, in, a, in a good state. I think there's a lot in this live forever that means more than simply do what you're doing today. And if you know God's plan, living forever is going to be much grander than it is today. It's hard to imagine. If I go back to my younger days, believe it or not, I had some. I'm telling my grandkids... You know, they're, they're getting into sports now, you know. And some are really good in these sports. Soccer, football, basketball, and uh, football. Football was my sport, American football, not the Asian football is soccer, which I didn't learn. I might have liked that. That's a lot of running. Football in America is enough. I like that. The, those were days of glory. Days of shining, days of coming out number one or sometimes failing. Life is more than all those glorious things that we've done in the past. 
We've had some happy and good things, and we've had some sad things. How are we going to live in the future when there's no sad things at all? No breakdowns, no bones cracking under the weight of a 300 pounder, and I'm only 150 or 160 at that time. Yes, it's hard to imagine. We can't imagine living forever. Do you desire really to live forever? It's kind of beyond our, our thinking, but we need to consider it. Because here's the testimony of God, and we are actually coming to the climax of this book. This is what John was leading to as he built up this testimony again and again throughout the book. Only the Son of God stands where you need to believe, receive him, and know that forgiveness of sins is forever wiped away. John has given conclusive proof at the end of this book that we can know this, and it's a matter of possession. You see that word used twice in verse 12, the concluding statement of the syllogy? It's have or have not. That's a matter of having in your hands something, possessing it, holding on to it, anything. But this possession is not just about what you know up here in your head, what you really understand. Maybe you really know and understand that Jesus is the Son of God, but perhaps not in your heart. Because possession is about the heart. Eternal life is called many things in Scripture, you know. It's called salvation, being saved, believing, being born again, having faith in the faith, in Christ, on and on it goes throughout the New Testament. All of these are the same as what we're talking about here, eternal life in the Son. We have many Christian terms that we use for being saved and having eternal life but it's still a matter of possession of the Son. Not just knowing terms. There are those who think they're saved, even think they have the Son, but do not. When we talk about possession in the hand, that's one thing, but possession in the heart, only you can know that. Others will see that as it works out in your life. That's why we have outreach. That's why we have gospel. That's why we have missions. That's why we have church. There's no church without the gospel. Because church is people. Called out people. People that God has brought together to worship him. If we say the Son of God in your heart, we're using a term here that's really not found in Scripture. Those terms, we talk about having Jesus in our heart, okay? And scripture doesn't say that. You know, if you look often at the term in your heart, it's often evil according to the Scripture verses. But what is in Scripture is that Jesus wants to be at the very core of our being, we say, on the throne. Okay, another term that's not in the Bible, but we know that he is King of kings and Lord of lords and wants to reside in us. So when we say in our heart, we're talking about the very center, the core of our being. What's in there? Well, actually, uh, in the Old Testament, the mind the center of our intellect, how we think and everything, how we feel, emotions, all came from the heart, the core of our being, the center of our being. And we come to the New Testament, and then the conscience, and I'm bringing this up again because it's right in the heart. It's right there. That's where guilt resides. That's where all of our sins pool together, and that's where we're stretching 
this way and that way with right and wrong, choosing what is right and wrong. But we don't have that ability, do we? Really to choose to do right every time and no right every time. And that is one of the main reasons we need him to possess us so that we can possess him in the very center of our being, in our heart. Now I want you to turn to Romans chapter 10. You know these verses, but just a reminder, Romans chapter 10. And we're going to read verses 8 through 11. Just as a reminder, here we are. Here we are. Again, my version may be a little different from yours, but you can read and follow. Romans chapter 10, beginning with verse 8. On the contrary, well, you'll have to read all those things that he's brought up here, these questions. What does it say? The message is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. This is the message of faith that we proclaim. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. With the heart one believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth one confesses, resulting in salvation. Take these words to heart. God knows what's going on with each and every one of us and whether we truly have possessed the Son in our hearts, God himself living in us. One more passage, and because I've mentioned the conscience so many times here, chapter 10 of Hebrews. Turn over to chapter 10 of Hebrews. A little exercise today, huh? Chapter 10 of Hebrews. Now, I remind uh, my class in small group, this is number four of the five verses in Hebrews that has the word conscience. So you want to note this. We're going to only have one verse, chapter 10, verse 22. Again, this doesn't fall alone. It falls in a context. And it's a context that is calling us. Let us draw near, he says, with a sincere heart or a true heart. In full assurance of faith, we need that every day. That assurance that we are standing there with Christ and he with us. He possesses us, we possess him. In full assurance of faith, our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. I don't know how often you think of your evil conscience, but God thinks about it. He knows about it. And he provided the blood of Christ and the sprinkling process reflects back to the purification processes they had in the Old Testament to cleanse away and take away the impure, the defiled, and make it acceptable to God. For your heart to possess holiness, the Son of God, it must be pure and clean. And so he says, sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Now the sense of water here is different from what we have in 1 John. Here it's a little more metaphorically speaking of the word of God and sanctification process that keeps us clean, keeps us pure. Body, mind, heart, and soul. Everything. Everything. You see, when God works on the inside, everything comes to the outside. So it doesn't matter really what you look like to the world. It matters what you look like to God. So we may dress up for God. We may dress down for God. We may dress up for people. We may dress down. 
But God's looking at who do you possess in your heart? Is it clean? Has it been cleaned by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ? Having or possessing Christ means having him at the very center of your being. Having a cleansed heart from an evil conscience is a huge difference from many Christians that know about Jesus Christ but have other things that they put forth their salvation and base it on, base their faith on. When we are possessed by Jesus and God, what does he do? There's in these words of John, built in here, a relationship. And what is the basis of that relationship? Well, that's why we have verse 13. Come to verse 13 and read it again. I have written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Now, there's two words that implore us to do something, and one word, the name of Christ, that stands out to be the epitome of this whole thing. You know, a name is not just a, a designation for a person. In this sense here, what John is writing, the name represents the person. That's who he is. The name of Christ. So to come to the name, to believe in the name, to receive the name, and to know that you have that name means you have eternal life. Jesus is the Son of God, not a God, not one of many, only one, and you only need one God anyway. The name above all names that all will bow before, it says in Philippians 2. And those two words that we need to follow in this statement are believe and know. Now, when I went to Bangladesh and we talked about believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, and people would say, we believe, we believe. But then there would be things missing in their lives and it was evident that they did not possess Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in their lives in their hearts. It was very evident. And then some of the Bengali who were believers there that we were working with said to say believe is not enough. You have to say believe and receive. There's the possession part that John is emphasizing for us. It's something that you hold in your heart just like you hold a glass of water when you drink it in your hand. Now, from 1 John 3.23, there's a reminder that God gives a commandment to believe Him. So you can't escape this and say, oh, this doesn't apply to me. This is for everyone. I have a friend who's a chaplain in jail over here below Harrisburg. And he's written a couple books. And you know, you work, work as a chaplain in a jail for a while and you begin to learn how the, all these prisoners think and how they move, move around and how they believe. And it's interesting because the way he writes, you can hear him talking to these prisoners as he's written his book. He's speaking their language. And he's pointing out to them that God is not just something you can turn away from and ignore or say, that's not for me. God is real. He has given us certain commands and he commands us to believe.
Chapter 4, verse 1 in 1 John tells us, don't believe all the spirits out there. There's lots of teachings out there. So there's warnings in Scripture that, yes, you're going to be led this way and that way, and people come up to me all the time and say, oh, there's many ways to God. I'm sorry, there's not. There may be many teachings out there about how to get to God and all the different ways, but there's only one way, and it's Jesus, the Son of God, is the only way, and you must possess him in your heart. John says, believe. Now, you might remember this verse 13 sounds a little bit like John's book, John 20, 31. But in that verse, he says he wrote to unbelievers. I have written to those who need to believe. I'm paraphrasing, but in John 20, 31, he wrote that book, the book of John, for unbelievers. This book he has written for believers to give them assurance of salvation, assurance that God is working from within us out to the world. That word knowing is a very big word in, in the, this epistle of John, 22 times seven times alone in this chapter, chapter 5. And again, this is the climax of the book. In other words, there's many things for us to know, but he's again not talking about the head, he's talking about the heart. He's talking about a relationship. The words that he uses, the context that he uses for knowing Jesus, possessing Jesus, is about a relationship. And a relationship, if it starts now, never ends because he's given it a name called eternal life. This is the testimony of God. You can have eternal life in the Son. So having this kind of relationship in the center of your life means that every day is a new opportunity for us to shuck off the sin and live in righteousness and purity and peace and many, many other things in a relationship, a true relationship with God himself, with the Son of God. Well, I know that's a challenge. I know it's not easy. But think about this. Do you have a, a, a really good friend, a close friend? Friends are kind of hard to find sometimes, especially if you're here as a foreigner among us, or like me, I felt like a foreigner when I came to this side of Pennsylvania, since I'm from Illinois, and I say things differently. Rick is from Texas. You've been here a while, but you're still a foreigner, perhaps, or feeling foreign sometimes. We have uh, all come here from various places. Some of you have been here a long time, though, among the, the, the Dutch German, the German Dutch, or whatever they are. Do you have a close friend? I mean a friend who will listen to you anytime, not condemn you, not put you down. He knows your needs. He cares for you. He will listen. Oh, well, sometimes he may rebuke you. Close friends do that. They see the flaws. And they can mention the flaws, the weaknesses that we have. They can point them out. But you know, they won't put their thumb on it and start pressing on it to make you hurt worse. Close friend will love you when you're wrong and when you're right. Some of our deepest needs come from having close friends. Ones that won't ridicule us and make us sh feel shame and feel stupid. Again, those kind of friends are few. 
Are you all thinking of that verse in Scripture that says Jesus is a friend of sinners? In the context of those who are outcasts from the society, tax collectors and sinners? Or if you can't think of that category, you were in it at one time because we were all in it. Jesus is a friend of sinners, you and me. Here's where John's love of Jesus shines through, I think. Leaning on the breast of Jesus at the Last Supper, being the apostle whom Jesus loved, perhaps being the youngest of those 12 disciples, yet living the oldest to carry on the testimony. And I see him pleading with us here in these verses that say, he who has, not the, son, he who has the Son has life eternal. And he who does not possess the Son does not have life eternal. Trusting in Jesus' name is more than just a statement. Having him in your heart is more than just in your head. It's walking with that all the time as a center of your being, directing you. He is the one to fulfill all of our needs, our physical needs. I talked about a lawyer. You may need a lawyer. We need those counselors and advisors. He is that. You may need someone who can take you to spiritual level number 44 when you're stuck at 43. Or maybe you're still at number one. I don't know. Jesus wants to be your friend and more. And John's words saying, here it is, possess him, have him. You know, there's a difference between trying to live for Jesus and having him live within you. There's a great difference. Believe and receive him. Know him in the very core of your being. Oh, he's going to change some things. I'll bet you're glad when they come out of the prison and they've said they've believed and received Jesus Christ, I'll bet you're glad that they're changing some things in that prisoner's life. We've all come out of the prison of sin and things need to change and keep changing. The unchangeable God wants to change us one day at a time, one moment at a time, one sin at a time sometimes. Sometimes more than one. But you know what he's not going to change? He's not going to change the real you. I'm not going to have any problem recognize who you are and perhaps what your name is, although that might change. There's hints in Scripture that our names might change when we all get to heaven. When we're all there standing before Jesus and seeing him, it says we will know him. The one who has known us, the one who has possessed us, and we will finally know him completely. We all need eternal life. You may laugh. You may think that's crazy. You may think, I don't need this. I can walk away from this. I can do my own thing. You can do everything except save yourself. Actually, eternal life is not free. And I don't believe you can make a decision to have eternal life. You know, because the believing and receiving is all something that God enters into in helping us because it's not possible without his help. It's a matter of possessing the Son. 
being one with God, the thing that we can't imagine is what God wants to do. I'd like you to bow your heads as we close. And I'm going to invite those of you who do not know for sure that you have the Son in your heart, I'm going to invite you to come up here and talk to me afterwards or talk to one of our elders. There's Rick, there's Rob. You can talk to one of the ladies too, who you have great confidence in. Those who have already received and know that you possess Christ in your life, pray. For those who do not, please bow your heads and let's pray together. Heavenly Father, would you draw us to yourself again and again? Actually, as I stand here, I, I realize again, I did not choose this message. You chose the message, even last night, to give to your people here at Bethany. But some do not care. Some do not want this. I pray you draw them. Show them the beauty of Jesus Christ in their lives that they may receive and believe and have that greatest possession of all. And Lord, I pray that you'd possess us to grow in the love and nurture of Jesus Christ so that we can be perfect, we can be holy, we can be righteous, and we can be unashamed both now and forevermore. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.